Hello, thank you for being with us today. I'm Ellie Witter with the Miami University Alumni Association. This year, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the relationship between Miami University and the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma. Miami University and the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma first connected in 1972, which resulted in a 50 year long partnership between the two Miamis. Today, we are joined by Cam Schreiber for this third installment of the webinar series entitled, A History of the Miami Tribe and Miami University. How did a tribe and a university come to build a fruitful relationship? Now celebrated as a unique and positive partnership spanning 50 years, the story behind the tribe and university relationship is both fascinating and critical to the histories of both partners. Cam Shriver is a historian of early America. His re research includes Native Americans and the empires in the Great Lakes and the history of the, of, sorry, excuse me, and the history of Miami land ownership. He also teaches in Miami's history department. I'm so pleased to welcome you, Cam. Thank you for being here. There will be time throughout the presentation for questions, so please submit your questions just below the screen with the link. And now I will turn it over to Cam. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Ellie. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm sure there are people with more knowledge about this relationship than I have, but um, uh, in any case, Nawe Piaiikwe for coming. Thank you uh, for coming here today to talk about uh, an intertwined history uh, between an entangled history between the Miami tribe and Miami University. I think from my perspective, having researched this and now preparing a book about this topic, um, it's, and I hear the tornado warning going off because it's noon in Ohio on a Wednesday, which means my dog will begin howling in the background. Uh, so keep that. So if you hear, if you hear that in the background, that's my dog howling at the, at the tornado uh, sirens. Uh, but I think, that you can't really tell the story of Miami University or the Miami tribe without integrating the other. And so that's what I'll be doing uh, here today. All right, let's see if we have a break there. Um, so to begin with Miami University's land acknowledgement is something that uh, sometimes people ask about as more institutions, companies develop land acknowledgements, kind of what are we supposed to do with that? What do we, why, why do that at all? <clears throat> so what I'll focus on here are these three parts of this land acknowledgement that were, that were developed um, really in the Miami Center, which is where I work. Um, not by me, but uh, I'm not native, I'm not Miami, Miami um, but I work at Miami University in the Miami Center. And so um, it's really kind of a, a starting point and, and I wanna take each piece in turn as we talk for the next uh, 45, 50 minutes. So Miami University is, uh, like all universities, um, is on Indian land. So Miami University is located within the traditional home uh, domains of Miami and Shawnee people. They ceded this land in 1795 at the end of a war of conquest. And the Miami people were named after the Miami people in the Miami region were forcibly removed, deported from this area, their homes in 1846. But jumping forward many generations in 1972, an unlikely relationship began between the university and the tribe. And it evolved into something that's more reciprocal. Uh, so there's been change in the last 50 years. What that partnership is really all about is restoring and revitalizing Miami community knowledge um, for the benefit of Miami people. While the university benefits um, to some degree, the main stakeholders are the Miami tribe, in my view. And then we'll, we'll end with kind of where we sit today, which sets up uh, some future talks about this. So as a reminder, this is uh, Miami Onga. And if you saw George Ironstrack's presentation, uh, several weeks ago, you'll have a, uh, a good understanding of Miami history. But this is a map of Miami traditional settlements. Um, it's a shared landscape, a place that's shared with uh, Shawnees, um, Delawares, Wyandots, other relatives of the Miami people. But the core settlements after 1715 were along the Wabash River. What in in the Miami language, the Wapashikisipi, with the Wabash River, um, with uh, some towns 
a prominent settlement at modern day Piqua that was a Miami town, an inner tribal town, very large city in modern day Piqua called Piquawillany. So that's just grounding us um, kind of where we are at Miami University and where the Miami nation, um, the traditional homelands, the Miami and uh, the traditional homelands of Miami people. So what are the key beats? If we're telling a story about the tribe and the university in tandem, kind of what are the, what are the phases that we should focus on? I wanna focus on land because I think it's something that's uh, talked about quite a bit. Um, it's integral to what a university is with a campus. Uh, Miami University is a landowner, a large landowner. How did it acquire that land and from who? Um, I also wanna think about why 1972 uh, we're here at 50 years, which gives us a, a long runway to really look back and think about what the 1960s, 1970s, why did the relationship only begin in 1972? And then looking uh, since the 1970s, over the past 50 years, uh, somewhat briefly thinking about how, it, how the partnership really evolved from just a, a first meeting into something that now is really being celebrated by both the university and the tribe. So it really is uh, two, two partners um, that really value this relationship. So the university, uh, sorry, when the United States established its sovereignty, its independence uh, from Great Britain in the 1780s, one of its first actions was to build an army on the Ohio River in order to conquer land that it claimed north of the Ohio River, which is what would become the states of Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, because it wasn't owned by the United States. So in the 1780s, uh, the U.S. built an army, uh, marched north uh, to conquer the tribes uh, that were then living around Fort Wayne. Um, they were defeated in 1790. They, the United States tried again in 1791 under a new general named Arthur St. Clair, who marched north and was defeated uh, again the next year, 1791, by the Miamis, Shawnees, and Delawares primarily, who were defending their homes. Uh, and the United States tried then a third time, building a, a larger standing army, raising new taxes, doing things like this, in order to um, assert its ownership of uh, Indian land in Ohio. And that third attempt, that third campaign was successful. It was a scorched earth campaign led by a guy named Matt Anthony Wayne. There was one United States Army at that time, and it marched north towards the Miami homelands, uh, Kikayonga, modern day Fort Wayne. Uh, it marched down the Maumee River to modern day Toledo, uh, burning crops literally the whole way. Um, so the entire Maumee River Valley was, was scorched, um, starving then the different nations who were living there, uh, surrendered these areas that you see marked on this map. That's the Treaty of Greenville, which is signed in Fort Greenville, Ohio, uh, just north of where I am today in Oxford, uh, in 1795, a treaty of peace and a treaty of land surrender. So that land... That, that I'm sitting on, that many of us may be sitting on, or, or if you came to Miami University where you lived when you were here as a student, um, was relinquished by the Miami tribe among their allies uh, after a bloody war. Um, many of the communities were starving, having their um, food all destroyed, um, and they surrendered much of their land, including Oxford's campus and the region around it in 1795. Land speculators were a big part of that story. Uh, individuals uh, primarily from you know, east of here, uh, east of Oxford, uh, were very interested in acquiring as much land as they could cheaply, holding onto it for a few years, um, buying it from the federal government. Um, they weren't able to, they weren't allowed to by federal law buy it from Native American people. So they had to buy it from the federal government hold on to it for a few years and then sell it in smaller pieces at a profit. It's called land speculation. Uh, as the values rise, you can make more money if you're, if you're an entrepreneur or capitalist with a lot of land. One of those individuals is a guy named John Cleve Sims. 
Um, and he acquires uh, before it had been conquered. So while it's clearly still Miami and Shawnee land in 1792, he had acquired a land grant, uh, which is often called the Sims Purchase or the Miami Purchase because it was between the two Miami rivers, Great Miami and Little Miami rivers, which are named because they lead to the Miami country where the Miamis are. That is where the Miami Indians are. So he acquired this land um, with the stipulation that he had to reserve one township of it for the use of an academy. And uh, then finally the land was conquered. So he had acquired this land before um, it had been relinquished by the indigenous uh, owners. Uh, he sold the land quite quickly um, in the 1790s um, and early 1800s. And so all of his land he had sold without reserving an area for an academy. So um, when they established the Miami University of Ohio, it was technically outside of the Miami Purchase, just on the west side of uh, the Great Miami River. Uh, but it was nonetheless called the Miami University uh, because it's in the Miami region and close to the Miami Purchase. So that's where we get our name. It's named indirectly, uh, Miami University, the Miami University is uh, named indirectly after the Miami people who gave their names to the, to the rivers around here. So Miami University had no state funding. Uh, all it had was an endowment and the endowment was only, uh, was primarily land. Um, the college was gifted uh, one township from the state of Ohio when it was established in 1803 and founded in 1809, as we all know. Um, and the land really was the endowment to, to make money. Uh, the university had to, um, the board of trustees who acquired this land from uh, the federal government had to, uh, had to settle the land. Um, and so they uh, invited settlers to come buy land in Miami Township, which is now Oxford Township, the college township, I should say, is now Oxford Township. Um, and they rented that land at 6% and eventually 2% of the value of the land every year. So uh, the main source of funding for Miami University until the Civil War uh, and until it begins to have state funding after in the area of New Miami in the 1870s, the main, the main source of funding for this college called Miami is the land that had been gifted to it um, almost immediately after um, the Treaty of Greenville, the war. And so you see this, old, this first map of Miami College lands, the Northwest being the College Corner, modern day College Corner, um, where the campus is laid out. Uh, originally, you can see kind of in the center there uh, with Four Mile Creek running through the College Township. So what that looks like is this, this is, this is Miami University's endowment, this chunk of land. And the first, uh, if you go to King Library today in the Havinghurst uh, Special Collections, you'll see big boxes full of these land, uh, land slips, rent slips essentially. Um, so people went to Hamilton, Ohio, they chose a spot on the map. They said, I'll buy this, this spot of land from you, the Board of Trustees of Miami University. And I agree to pay you 6% uh, of that value for 99 year uh, leases. Um, so, it, so it was a 99 year lease. Uh, you, could sell this, you could sell this lease. Um, and this is the very first one, the very first area uh, in College Township that was acquired by this guy named Alexander King in 1810 is right at the corner of, um, right at the end of Slant Walk. Um, so, so right where we, you think of the campus in the town kind of merging um, on High Street is the first place that was sold um, to settlers from the township. And what this looks like, adding it up, um, is that uh, indeed the majority of university revenue is land. Again, this is more than, there is no state kind of funding, taxes, you know, are not going towards uh, the university. This is much larger uh, source of revenue than tuition, um, which would be the other the other revenue generator for the university. Um, so it's it's not tuition, it's not taxes, it's really the the land rent. Uh, and this land rate might sound like 
very low numbers. Okay, so in the 1830s, um, six percent, which eventually the government lowers it to just two percent annual rent, uh, is only four thousand um, up to about by the 1960s, seventy five hundred dollars a year based on renting out this entire township, right? 36 square miles. Um, it might seem really low, but it's so, so much more, such a higher uh, level of rent than the, the Miami Nation is receiving during these same years. Um, so the Miami Nation is relinquishing areas the size of the state of Indiana for, for you know, le less than pennies on the dollar um, compared to what Miami University is, is earning uh, by renting its land. I'm going to stick with the theme of uh, the Miami tribe for a moment before I return to the university, because as the Miami University is achieving high levels of enrollment, students begin in 1824. Um, by the 1830s, the late 1830s, Miami University is the fifth largest uh, university in the nation, um, pulling a lot from Western families, both north and south of the Ohio River. Um, so Miami University is really making its mark um, in the 1830s and 1840s. In 1846, uh, the Miami Nation is deported from its homeland. It's a federal law that uh, Indian nations um, should, can, and must be deported out of states within the Union and deported that is removed out of states. So for the Miamis, uh, they uh, are loaded onto canal boats in October of 1846, go down the Wabash and Erie Canal in 1846. It's a, it's a Sunday in October when they pass through Hamilton, Ohio, past our campus, and eventually out to uh, Kansas City, and then march uh, overland to their reservation south of Kansas City. So their first reservation is in Kansas, Kansas territory at that time. Notice here in the middle of all these other nations that are being removed from east to west. So the Ottawa's also from Ohio, the Wyandots also from Ohio, Shawnee communities from Ohio, um, Potawatomi's, Osages, Cherokees, Iowa's, all these communities being pushed west of Missouri into Kansas, into Indian Territory, into Nebraska Territory. Uh, just in case you weren't at George's previous talk, uh, the Miami Nation was removed a second time, so deported a second time in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s down to modern day Oklahoma. So they had two, two forced removals um, over the course of, uh, of about 50 years. Now, we're gonna talk a little bit, I think we should talk about education in this story of the two Miamis, the tribe and the university. After all, this is an educational institution, right? The removal agent, the guy who's uh, hired to move Miami people, writes that really the Miamis aren't interested in education. They had no schools, with few exceptions, seems to care very little about the education of their children. At the same time, Miami leaders write in English to President James K. Polk uh, from Kansas, where they've just been moved to. They write something strikingly different, which um, is that we feel sensibly the want of instruction of ourselves to be willing to bequeath to our posterity the same hereditary ignorance. We hope, great father, which is the president, that a thousand dollars reserved for school purposes in one of the treaties will henceforth be spent in our midst and for the welfare, not of a few, but all, of all the children of our nation. In other words, what they're writing is that um, they have education funds. They want to make sure that they build schools among them in Kansas. Um, rather than send their children away to schools. And I want to highlight that they want local uh, family-controlled education, um, despite the idea that maybe Native people or Miami people in particular are, just aren't really interested in, in acquiring any education. Now, Miami's land endowment was privatized uh, in the 1950s and 60s because uh, if you think about the university budget, $7,500, which is about the max that they can raised from land rents is very low. $7,500, um, it costs more to administer all of these land rents than, than the money they're making. So um, some, of, some of you in the audience, I'm sure, recall or might still actually be paying your yearly land rents, um, but you can buy out of that. Uh, and so um, 
you can make one-time payments to, to fully privatize your land uh, outside of the university's control. Um, so this land is still owned by the Board of Trustees, which acquired it in, in 1803 and 1809, uh, unless you've privatized your land within our township. Thinking, continuing to think about education at Miami University, I was struck by uh, one, one case, and then we'll probably turn to, turn to questions. Uh, one case of, uh, of, of a couple of individuals here. So Benjamin Drake is kind of a local historian. He is addressing the Aridelphian Society at Miami University, which is an early debating society, and he's doing it in 1831. And he tells these students that white settlers had driven the Indians from hill to hill, from prairie to prairie. Their council fires are almost extinguished. Their traditions are nearly forgotten. The last echo of their war song is but faintly heard along the receding frontier. Like the white mist of the morning on their native hills, they are melting away. Native people are kind of vanishing, melting. They're being driven from place to place, being driven west. And he says that to an audience of predominantly white youths who are undergraduates, but not only, because one of them sitting in um, the room is a guy named James Folsom, who's from Choctaw Nation in Mississippi, and his nation is about to be deported from Mississippi to Indian Territory, modern day Oklahoma. James Folsom, was a member of the Aridelphian Society at Miami University. He came to Miami University funded by the War Department. And people knew that he was native. Uh, he was phenotypically native. This is, there's no image of James A. Folsom, but he's a Choctaw Indian. And this is his little brother, uh, Samuel Folsom. They're from a wealthy, well-to-do uh, Southern family who happened to be Choctaws. And he's writing from Oxford, Ohio, just about a month after Benjamin Drake says that native people are vanishing from the region. And he writes to his, his uncle, Peter Pitchlin, in English, and he's complaining about how cold it is in Oxford. And he writes from Old Main, modern day Harrison Hall. And he says, dear uncle, we're separated in person, yet you are never absent from my thoughts. I'm afraid I never will have the pleasure of visiting those native hills and running streams, which I once delighted to view nature and all her loveliness clothed with its richest hue. And those streamlets which glide along forever will be forgotten. When I steer my bark, that is kind of a boat, to the shores of the Red River, to view a new country whose rivers flow along sublime from the base of the Ozark Mountains and where I hope we will all meet to give each other final welcome and never more depart. Only when time and death shall bid us go into the tomb, but still we will have one consolation on our side, and that is to die in our own country, where we will mingle with this earthly, uh, mingle this earthly frame beneath the sod of a buried ancestry. We have our misfortune with other nations on this continent. This is an incredibly unique letter uh, that's at the Gilcrease Museum in Tulsa. He's writing from Oxford, a native student, and he says something that's incredibly radical. The Cherokee, who are being removed, this is not his nation, but another Southern nation, the Cherokee have been treated by the American Republic unworthy of the head of a civilized government. Her name will go down to future eyes with scorn and repro reproach on her head. She will feel it in her legislative halls. It will never be eradicated from her history. Historians will have to write it down on her pages, which will go down to the latest posterity. This letter was more or less forgotten. Um, I don't think that we at Miami University knew about it, but when I just when I when I discovered it, I thought, you know, that's right. He he wanted people to read his thoughts about his nation's removal. And while we we've, we've been talking a lot about removal in the United States ever ever since, um, to have these native perspectives written so eloquently about what it feels like to have your nation pushed from uh, their homeland to somewhere new, nonetheless, uh, or or remarkably written here in Oxford. Uh, most of us don't know that there are indigenous students going to Miami University in 1830. And he speaks, he speaks in Choctaw. Uh, there are notes about this. He gives a Choctaw speech to the Aridelphian Society here at Miami University in 1830. Um, so it's really remarkable to remember who this James A. Folsom was. It's unclear what happens to him once he leaves. Um, 
about 25% of Choctaws perished on the on the trail of their trail of tears. So perhaps perhaps that was his fate. I'm not sure. There are still Folsom's in Choctaw Nation today. So that brings us to the Miami's removal, a clear separation uh, from their namesake university, uh, which sets up part two, which is why, why did it take until 1972 um, for this relationship really to, to kick off? Are there, are there any questions? I'd welcome questions or comments. Yeah, so there are a couple questions um, and kind of going with the, the removal question, um, are there any of the Miami people living in Ohio still or present day? Mm -hmm. uh, one family remained in, in uh, Ohio, in modern day Maumee, Ohio, um, legally allowed to remain. Um, no one uh, kind of lived in Ohio um, after the removal, except for that one family. But many people have moved back to the Midwest or back to Ohio. So currently, uh, and I asked that, I, I, I've asked um, the Miami Nation, the Miami Tribe, Oklahoma for enrollment figures. Uh, in Ohio, there's about 150 Miami citizens. So those are people who are enrolled in the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma. And in Indiana, there are about a thousand. There were there were several families who were allowed to remain in Indiana through treaty. So they weren't hiding out or anything. It was just, yep, you have a home, you own your land, you're allowed to stay, and you remain Miami, uh, even in Indiana. So 325 Miamis were deported, and about 150 um, remained in Indiana in 1846. And then since then, there are people, you know, Miami citizens, I know in Columbus, Cleveland, Toledo, um, several families here in Oxford. So uh, about 150, I think. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and kind of going with uh, Oklahoma, we have a, a viewer who is near Oklahoma, near the Oklahoma border, and is wondering if there are events or ways that they can be involved with the Miami tribe in Miami, Miami Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are several big public events that the Miami tribe really welcomes visitors to. Um, I know I, I know because every time I'm there, they say, ah, yeah, come on down. Everyone, everyone from particularly uh, associated with Miami University is going to be very welcome in Miami, Oklahoma. So if you're driving through Joplin uh, to Miami towards Tulsa or vice versa, you're right on the highway there um, and you could stop into the gift shop or something um, and, and see some people. Other than that, though, if you want an event, I would go to MiamiNation.com and the big events that you might be interested in are the summer powwow, which happens uh, in late June, um, which is a warm, a warm powwow in Oklahoma. So the, the summer gathering and then winter gathering, um, which is typically in late January, where a lot of Miami people, a lot of uh, people from the university, I should say, go to Miami, Oklahoma. And it, there's kind of a, a, a dance and storytelling and it's, it's a more cultural event. Um, so, so those are two possibilities if you're if you're local yeah absolutely great thank you and then one more question that's a little bit more personal um are you related to susan shriver and the former president philip shriver yes <laughs> well, <laughs> phil, uh, phil shriver and martha shriver were my grandparents and um so i think there's a reason that i became a historian and got interested in miami university and miami tribe history and i think that's that's certainly a big reason for it so yep yeah. Absolutely. I can, think we can continue on. Okay. Thank you. Those are easy questions. I can, I can answer that one. The Miami tribe has not always had a positive relationship with former schooling. And I think that's worth highlighting to think about where we've been. There's a reason that <clears throat> the tribe turned to Miami University, and it's based on this history. There's probably no <clears throat> native families in the United States who are untouched by the indoctrination camps called boarding schools. Young children, adolescents, older children um, were taken to a distant, uh, the more distant, the better frequently from the point of view of assimilation campaigners to boarding schools, to learn not to speak their native language, to learn not to tell their winter stories, to practice their culture, um, to learn not to be native anymore. 
And that has impacted the Miami Nation to a great extent. This is one of the most famous photos of Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, perhaps the most notorious and famous of these camps called schools. Um, but there are many others. And briefly, I want to think through Miami people's experience at these colonial, that is kind of settler boarding institutions um, that are not that, that are made for them, but in order to fundamentally change who they are and how they how they will live. Jesse White, uh, we have an image of Jesse White Wapamangwa, who's from the reservation uh, near Marion, Indiana, the Mishinguamija family reservation near Marion, Indiana. Uh, he enrolls, among other many Native folks, at a place called Haskell Institution in Kansas, Lawrence, Kansas. Um, he there, uh, so he, he had come from a family of farmers. Uh, he was an orphan. Um, and uh, he was orphaned when he was younger. Uh, his family perhaps, I think, moved west to Kansas. And then he enrolled uh, at this boarding school called Haskell um, Indian School in Lawrence, Kansas, now Haskell Indian Nations University. And he embarked on a career teaching. He became a teacher where he went to other boarding schools to teach industrial arts, mainly farming. Uh, so he ended up um, on many reservations teaching pr primarily Plains communities, um, the Sioux and, and Crows in Montana, uh, how to farm and how to irrigate their farms. Um, but part of the point of, you know, for thinking about why are indigenous children being pulled, pushed into these institutions, um, it's, it's said um, most plainly by Richard Henry Pratt, a general, who gave his reasons for uh, building Carlisle Indian School, which is a great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one. In a sense, I agree with the sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in, in him and save the man. And that was a public lecture. Um, given in 1892. And so there is a purpose to this and it's it's quite successful, this policy. Miami people went to a wide range of these boarding institutions in order to, to change them from being Miami or from being Indian into being working class, wage earning Americans. The red dots are primarily where Miami people are living during this period. So this is a federal policy uh, it uses McGuffey's readers to teach um, Native students English, and uh, McGuffey's readers developed here at, in, in Oxford. And uh, the, the blue or the other color are where Miami students went. This is Esther Miller, who's remembered today in her community. Uh, Esther Miller went to Carlisle in Pennsylvania. She was um, kind of led a successful life afterwards, uh, moving around at other boarding schools teaching, um, was really a progressive uh, intellectual um, who came and spoke at Ohio State University and other Eastern institutions um, discussing native rights. Uh, she eventually moved back to Oklahoma um, where she, where she uh, died among family and friends in the 1930s. This is someone that she went to school with, also Miami was Peoria and Ottawa, uh, Isidore Labadee, Labadee from, uh, from Miami, Oklahoma. Um, some of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren have come to Miami University now, uh, but she also went to Carlisle Indian School, moved back to Oklahoma, uh, continued her life as a farmer, raising children uh, on the prairies outside of Miami, Oklahoma. Clarence Miller was um, another Miller who went from Oklahoma to Carlisle School in Pennsylvania and uh, was actually the captain of the lacrosse team at Carlisle. Um, in his yearbook, he said his career aspiration was to become president of the United States. Um, the Millers had a, the male Millers had a particularly rough time after Carlisle, unfortunately, um, where they, had, they moved from place to place, uh, uh, cities primarily um, died in unfortunate circumstances, uh, after going to Carlisle, um, including his uh, relative John Miller, who's the one on the right, John Miller on the right, and uh, future chief of the Wyandots, 
Joel Cotter on the left at Carlisle Indian School. So both of these individuals from Oklahoma. The, My the uh, Miamis from Indiana also went to uh, places like Carlisle. This is Frank Godfroy. I'm helping, I, I wanna think about these individuals as individuals, right? As, as people with faces um, who we can know something about uh, through their letters, um, through things that they wrote for their school newspapers. Frank Godfroy uh, was also orphaned uh, and ended up at Carlisle Indian School with uh, his uncle, I believe named John Godfroy, who was from Fort Wayne and ended up being a policeman in Fort Wayne, actually. Uh, so this is a newspaper clipping that uh, shows him as a when he's a policeman at uh, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, John Godfroy. So he's also in Miami. Henry Froman, the Fromans uh, continue to be active in Miami and Peoria politics today. Henry Froman uh, on the Carlisle Indians um, baseball team, young Henry Froman, uh, as well as Addison Walker. Um, he has relatives who have come through Miami University since the 1990s. And this is Addison while a student at uh, Haskell Indian School in Kansas, um, as well as uh, a World War I veteran um, pictured on the right um, in Camp Travis, Texas. He ended up seeing action in Europe um, during World War I. So a picture of Addison as a youngster at boarding school and then as a, as a soldier, uh, an American soldier during World War I. And I wonder what, uh, there aren't, uh, s after James Folsom, I don't have records of any native students attending Miami University uh, until the 1970s. Um, but I wonder what they would have kind of experienced coming to Miami University. And so without any Miami students, I wonder, there's a similar student from uh, from the Wyandotte community. So, so her community had been removed from Ohio to Oklahoma. She came back, Arizona Jackson was her name. She ended up teaching the Miami Day School in Oklahoma after her, after her education. But she's Wyandotte and she goes to Earlham just over, over the state line in Richmond in 1881. And she wrote back home, whenever a student came, the first thing they saw was the Indian girl. Some of the girls came and asked me where she was and seemed to be surprised when I told them that I was the Indian girl. That shows that they saw me different from what they expected. So many that know nothing of Indians can't think of them in any other way and being savages, uncivilized, and anything but the right thing. I wanted to put that, that idea out there as we go forward. What do, what do non-Native people expect Native people to, to be, to act like, to sound like, to look like? Um, it's often so different um, from the stereotypes that some of us uh, unintentionally um, carry with us. And she was experiencing that uh, in the 1880s. Miami University, for its part, uh, is part of this process of telling, retelling, revising its history uh, in new ways to, to make sense of the idea that Native people seem to seem to have vanished. Um, they usually don't talk about um, the state-sponsored deportation of, of the people uh, that was so successful, but rather a, a more nebulous process. This is a pageant developed by um, then a professor, President, uh, future President Upham, um, and his students called a pageant, pageant of Miami. It was performed um, like so many pageants in this era. It was performed locally to make sense of local history. And it begins with, quote unquote, Miami, uh, a Miami sachem giving a speech. And this is obviously played by a non-Indigenous person, uh, but gave a speech as if he was Miami. Hear ye, warriors of Miami, hear me in the solemn council. Now through the land of the Miami, mighty race of mighty warriors, flows the steady stream of white men rushing here and pooling there, striving for a land of freedom. Whence they came, they knew it now. Here they settle sternly turning all our forest into towns. So the transformation of a landscape from Indian country to something else. All our race will be forgotten. All our deeds unknown to song. All our lore lost to story, all our prowess dragged in dust. For huge cities, Homes of white men, strange new customs, manners grow in the land of the Miami. Toward the sun, our race must bend. So my brothers of Miami, let us onward our goal. Progress, culture, wealth, and service take our place upon this soil. And the name which we've long cherished, long we've cherished, shall be born in honor long here within the land of hunters by Miami's tower-topped halls. 
So just the name remains. So says this uh, imagined Miami chief, only the name. Our race has bent to the West. No more stories or songs, uh, nothing more about, about us remains. It's a very to total picture of um, the erasure of indigenous people from this campus, this area. And it's in that context that new stereotypes can be invented. So new traditions can be invented. The most uh, obvious being uh, with the rise in uh, intercollegiate sports and Miami attempting to take its place uh, in that landscape to brand itself as different from these other institutions that are in Ohio or in the region, uh, Miami uh, kind of moves into new nicknames and mascots in specifically in 1929. 1929, after a football game, Frank Games, who's a player on the Miami football team, uh, meets with President Upham then, President Alfred Upham. Uh, and they apparently have a, a wide ranging discussion where Frank Games, a football player, suggests that while all the other colleges in Ohio are animal names, we should pick something different. And they suggest uh, this new nickname, which begins with R. And uh, that's corroborated by memories of Frank Games later writing um, letters about how he, he had wanted to um, get, among other things, Miami University to uh, hire Paul Brown um, for its football coach, which they did not do. But it, this 1929 uh, decision kind of pushes Miami University into this new territory, uh, including the development of a, a mascot that comes to be called Hiawabop, which is an imagining of a Plains Indian um, not related to Miami people at all, not not depicted by Miami people, not not in ha not impersonated by Miami people, just a, a an invention. And uh, it's it's heavily associated this this relationship, such as it is with between Miami University and quote unquote Indians, is really um, a sports and marching band um, relationship. Again, not with actual native people, um, but with an imagining of what native people might have looked like sometime in the past or who knows in the present. Are there any, uh, any brief questions before we push on to 1972, <laughs> more modern uh, history? Uh, there are not that many questions that have come in. So if anybody does have a question, feel free mm -hmm. to enter that with the link just below the screen. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think what what you're talking about it is quite interesting um, that the, the imagining of what something looks like, I think it is really interesting and wondering how, like, where does that imagery even come from? Mm -hmm. Like saying what um, the football player was talking to President Upham, like where did, where did that even let that, that thought come from actually i'm sure you don't know that answer but it's an interesting thing to think about of where where do those imageries and um developments come from yeah uh, i i'm trying to answer that uh for myself uh, there are a few really i, I don't want to take too long because i know we some of you want to maybe talk about things in your lifetime but uh uh one of the interesting things i found is that i looked at where did frank games come from this football player and what do you know, when he was a high school student in the 1920s, his hometown, Coshocton High School, adopted a new nickname. And it also started with R. And it was that same name. So my university kind of copied Coshocton, Ohio High School. Um, a, a lot of universities are adopting native names at this time. So it's a little bit ironic that my university is trying to carve its space as being different the same way that other schools are trying to carve the same space uh, or, or invent the same tradition. So the University of Illinois, Stanford, Dartmouth, um, they're kind of trading the icons back and forth. Uh, so Stanford's, that initial kind of scalp lock Indian uh, is I think used at Stanford for a time. Um, so they're kind of, they're, they're not using native imagery as much as trading among other uh, universities to kind of to brand themselves as, as different, as progressive, as large uh, through a, a marching band, for example, with bra primarily brass instruments. Uh, these are kind of new inventions. Um, so uh, to get alumni engaged is part of, is part of it, yeah. Interesting. 
Uh, so we do actually have a question that has come in. So it's in tracing the Meow Meow families and children, what has been the best records for finding where they went to school, where they live? Is it school records or is it census? Combination mm -hmm. of all of those things. Mm -hmm. Combination, yeah. <laughs> um, the Carlisle Indian School, we know so much about because they've digitized all of their records. So a lot of the imagery that I'm showing you is coming from uh, the county, uh, Cumberland County Historical Society, I think, um, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, through Dickinson College as well. Um, so that's a place that I would recommend if you go to car, if you just search Carlisle, you can you can find a lot of this uh, stuff. Uh, I, I have to give a lot of credit and um, credit to Bobby Burke, who's helped me find a lot of things. Uh, who, my colleague Bobby Burke. Um, um, Others who have kind of fed me information. Uh, there's a there's a strong native press um, in coming out of boarding schools where they're trying to connect alumni uh, from their boarding schools together and are receiving reports, letters, kind of about. Well, Esther Miller now works uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. She's a happy housewife, um, and so you can kind of track some of these individuals digitally through. Uh, alumni networks um, from those individual schools as well. Yeah. Awesome. I think we can continue on. That sounds great. So why 1972? Um, in 1970, in the 1960s and 1970s, the Vietnam War era, um, we move into a new phase of the relationship. Miami University students had petitioned uh, their student government to change the name, uh, the nickname in 1971 uh, and 1972. Student government passed a, passed a resolution uh, asking administration to change the name in 1972. The president at that time set up an ad hoc committee, which was something that he, that people do, uh, something that he did. And he had done similar things for, uh, for example, trying to address issues of diversity recruiting and retaining black students and staff uh, was an issue, continues to be an issue at Miami University. Um, so these ad hoc committees to to investigate certain problems. And he invest, uh, set up an ad hoc committee made up of some faculty, staff, and students to investigate the use of Miami University's nickname. And in the course of that, they wrote to uh, the chief of the Miami tribe in Oklahoma. They didn't know if there was a Miami tribe. Uh, they wrote to Washington, D.C. to get his address. The chief of the Miami tribe at that time was named Forrest Olds, pictured here on the right with the bolo tie. Um, and so this is kind of the, the moment, 1972, that we point to as now we've come 50 years from this 1972. It's in the context of the race-based nickname that the correspondence begins. At Miami University, of course, uh, some of you will remember the Rowan Hall takeover in 1970 the, in the Vietnam War. Students, uh, the briefest version I can give, I suppose, is my understanding is that students were, many students were uh, disillusioned with having the ROTC building uh, and its connections to the, to the military. So central on campus during the era of Vietnam. Um, so there's a history in 1970 of students taking it upon themselves to initiate change um, at the university. Miami administration is keenly aware of that in 1972 as they address this issue. Uh, is Miami in the wrong? What should we do differently uh, or, or should we change it all? Um, James Cooley, who is a former Hiawabop, that is the mascot dancer, um, called and wrote to Chief Forrest Old in Miami, Oklahoma, the elected chief of the nation. With great excitement and trepidation, I telephoned him that same day to discuss the relationship and whether to continue our warm bond of historical heritage or terminate it forever, which is an amazing kind of um, duality there. Either we keep the nickname or that warm relationship, this historical heritage is just is just over like that. And this is the first, you know, this is the first contact that the tribe and the university have had since 1840. So um, this is kind of the, me the memory of some of the individuals uh, around 1972. Um, 
Chief Olds, for his part, is a pretty conservative guy. Okay, he's a farmer in rural Oklahoma, um, Baptist. Uh, somewhat elderly in the 1970s. Um, he had gone to Commerce High School at the same time as Mickey Mantle was going there in Commerce, uh, Oklahoma, near Miami, Oklahoma. So he farms 900 acres, um, soybeans and corn. But he responds to Miami University saying, first of all, I am not a militant. And so clearly, like the university, the Miami tribe, or at least Forest Olds, are thinking through the radical 1960s, early 1970s. In this context, it's the context of red power, which is a play on black power. So there are militant um, groups such as the American Indian Movement pictured on the left that have taken over uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs building, similar to the Rowan Hall takeover, um, dispersed with tear gas. Uh, but this is not the kind of, this is not the kind of leader that the Miami chief is. He's not a young radical. He doesn't wear a red beret and long braids. You know, he's he's the guy on the right. He, he's someone who says, I'm not a militant. Uh, that's not me, if that's what you're expecting. And so he doesn't, he gives a non-answer to Miami University. He says, I'd be reluctant to make a recommendation. And the term that they're describing, the term that they're asking permission to use is actually, uh, doesn't apply to Miami people, he says. Um, I don't see how that's a term that applies just to us. You'd have to ask all Native people, he kind of says. Um, and that's early in 1972, and that's before he visits Miami University. So the reason that he drops in at Miami University is because he's heard about it through letters based on the nickname. More important to the Miami tribe, and I'll move through this quickly because I do want to answer questions that, that might uh, pop up is uh, the Miami tribe is working on reparations for its lost land. This is the Miami tribe's business committee in the 1960s with Forrest Olds towards the left, future chief Floyd Leonard all the way at the right. Uh, so this is the elected leadership of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. And they're successful in proving that they were unjustly uh, compensated for huge swaths of land in the 1800s. They're receiving such low numbers, uh, su such low uh, amounts of money um, for their land that indeed they're successful in proving that they're they're receiving, you know, it's sometimes under 1% of fair market value of millions and millions of acres, um, which are being awarded here in the late 1960s. So Floyd Leonard and the Miami Nation are really active in this process of seeking historical redress. Um, and so while one image of Floyd Leonard and the Miami tribe is that it's a rural kind of conservative community, very small in the 1960s and 70s. He's also a forceful guy. I mean, he's a forceful leader. He writes to his senators, you know, things like this. Thanks very much for introducing Bill for distribution of judgment funds. But this is not what we asked for, and the business committee rejected it. If you want to try what we asked for, okay. If not, forget it. Thank you. You know, he's writing this to a, a U.S. sitting senator from Oklahoma. He's much more measured when he writes to Miami University. I would be reluctant to make a suggestion, he says. So having, having uh, decided, the university decides that uh, they're going to push forward with a resolution to keep the name uh, that they're using um, and as well as establish a scholarship for Native students, which is not taken up uh, by Miami people for a couple of decades. Um, Chief Old is still kind of receiving this odd treatment in Ohio. Uh, they, they don't expect him to be a native person. Um, or when they find out that he's native, they don't expect him to have modern amenities. They, a journalist literally asks him when he's in Ohio in 1966, do you know how to drive a car? And indeed he drives a Ford Fairlane, I believe, um, to his visit in 1972. So if you're imagining what this visit looks like, this is one of the images that I keep in mind large American made car. And so really this, this long history sets up, uh, makes this relation, this 50 year relationship even more compelling to me because it's not obvious. It's not a fait accompli, something that it really is only a name. These two conservative institutions, the tribe and the university, one is built on the other's land. They're meeting in this very fraught context of militancy, uh, activism, a race-based mascot and nickname. They developed this apparently successful relationship that other tribes and colleges have not been able to copy. 
So it's really compelling to understand that that long context for why this relationship actually is worth celebrating. And I think that it is because it's not it's not a natural it doesn't seem to be a natural partnership. Floyd, uh, sorry, Chief Olds dies in 1974 and the mantle is taken up by the new elected chief, Floyd Leonard. Pictured here with elected Princess Tammy Cruzon, who uh, does not attend Miami, even though she's recruited. Uh, development Director David Lawrence and the liaison between the university and the tribe, um, which is an important step. Tammy, uh, sorry, Sharon, Sharon Berkey Bile. It's not until 1991 that full tuition reimbursements are developed for Miami as citizens. And so it's at that point when the first three Miami students attend Miami University. Once the university agrees to uh, full tuition scholarships, that's when it's, it manages to attract Miami people as students for the first time in 1991. Pictured here are Chief Leonard in his regalia that he wears, woodland style regalia, uh, at the celebration of a room, uh, a heritage room, um, developed between Sharon Berkey Bile and again, my colleague, Bobby Burke in student affairs. Sharon Berkey Bile pictured here is really important as a liaison between Oklahoma and, and Oxford. And I wanna come back to something that I said earlier. She does not speak Miami. She doesn't speak Ottawa. She doesn't speak her native languages. Sharon Berkey Bile says in 1996 to Miami students who are there interviewing her, I used to beg grandfather McCoon's grandpa, teach me how to talk Indian. He just kind of look at me. Back then that was our way of protecting the younger generation because they were shielding us from the unpleasant things about their past. So in the 90s, Miami people had memories of their grandparents really not going back, uh, not talking about their experiences at boarding schools, which is a universal, almost a universal truth that uh, people who survived boarding schools did not want to talk about what they had experienced there and indeed didn't even want to teach their children or grandchildren their native language. As the relationship really develops and moves into acad academics, now there are faces, there are more students, the Leonard's, uh, an important milestone I, th I think to highlight is the, the Leonard's moving to Oxford, uh, Joe and Atsuko Leonard moving to Oxford and raising their children here. There's kind of a home base in Oxford, um, Joe Leonard, professor of management in the school business. Um, is really important in the 1980s and 1990s. Now there are students starting to come and enroll at Miami University and the tribe has, has uh, slowly changed its attitude about how the nickname is used by people, uh, decides that it would be the time to suggest a change to the university. And this is a very debated, um, debated decision among the tribe. Uh, but in 1996, they passed a formal resolution asking the Miami University to change its name. They request that of the Board of Trustees and the Board of Trustees in its next meeting acknowledges that uh, the Miami tribe can request the change and the Miami University will initiate that change. And they say, may this relationship, this is the tribe saying, we wanna push this relationship forward. To do that, we should change that name. We should change that imagery from um, it's primarily the name, not the image, uh, change the name from the old name to something else. They don't suggest what it should be, but we request that you change it away from that name. It's getting in the way of our educational initiative. That, uh, that debate. So this really is a, a golden age of expanding personal relationships as the nickname changes more people are going to Oklahoma, more people from Oklahoma are coming to Miami University. It really is a positive change if you're thinking about the relationship between the tribe and the university, the nickname changing in 1996-97. These are some uh, Looming Mao students, linguistic students um, in Oklahoma, some Jim Hamill students, anthropology students. Uh, many field schools begin going in the 19, uh, in the 1990s, mid-1990s. Um, this is I believe Evelyn Belmare showing uh, journalism students, Julia Boyce and Lindsay Levine, uh, 1998. Um, so if you go to the tribe's website today and see their newspaper, the seeds of that newspaper were established by Miami University journalism students 
reflecting a need on the part of the tribe to develop a newspaper. Uh, and, and so they donate their time, uh, their journal journalism. Um, they write the first stories under Hugh Morgan, journalism professor Hugh Morgan in the late 1990s. And that, that, that field school is really pointed to as one of the really successful initiatives um, among others that pull this relationship forward into being mutually beneficial as a helping the nation in Oklahoma um, in real kind of in real ways. With that positive academic relationship, um, the university, uh, sorry, the tribe decides to again pull the relationship uh, forward. They want to develop a place to develop cultural revitalization. And in Julie Olds' words, we had to turn to our friends at Miami University to do that. Julie Olds pictured on the left as the cultural preservation officer in the late 1990s of the tribe. She wants her relative, Daryl Baldwin, um, to continue developing language materials. By the 1990s, no, by the 1970s, 80s, no Miami people spoke the Miami language. To revitalize that language required a lot of research, time, space. They turned to Miami University and at a meeting in November of 2000, they asked Miami University, will you help us? Will you help us revitalize our language? Murtis Powell and eventually uh, the rest of the university said, yes, we should do this. This would be a good idea. That develops the Miami project. So it really pulls the relationship again it's totally out of athletics at this point. It's into a, an educational, it's education for Miami people, for a specific cultural group. And they had to really work on uh, creating this because this is not a Native American studies program. There's no blueprint for it. And many questions that we get about like what other universities or tribes are doing this uh, outside of tribal colleges. So let's say if Navajo Nation uh, owns and operates its own college, Something like that might be so specific to one culture. Um, other than that, there aren't any public or public colleges, universities doing this kind of cultural reclamation work. So that's what that's uh, makes it unique. It's not a colonial schooling. It's also um, indigenous education. As Reed Anderson in College of Arts and Sciences said, Miyamiaki were the recipient as Miami people. Main purpose of all this is not to create a huge body of academic research, but do it in an applied way that would benefit the Miami people. It, taught, it took a lot of explaining for people to think, how is it going to work? We don't know how this how this thing is going to work. And so this Miami project begun in 2001. Uh, this is the Miami project. Daryl Baldwin in an office in King Library uh, has now grown to the Miami Center, which can do things like develop land acknowledgments uh, and also educate the new crop of Miami students who are no longer going to boarding schools, but now many of them are coming to this university to receive Miami education, as well as their Miami University undergraduate education. These are some of those students. And so now it's, it really is about the research and the students and um, developing educational materials. Those educational materials are owned by the Miami tribe. And now I'm getting into, into the context and territory of what my colleague Kara Strauss, I think we'll talk about at the next alumni webinar uh, in August. But that, that educational materials are, are developed here at the university and are owned by the Miami tribe, which is really an important, um, an important aspect of this that sometimes is overlooked. Again, you, again unique in higher education. And so now rather than the old Indian head logo, what we call the Indian head logo, uh, which represented one vision of what Miami people might have looked like, let's say 500 years ago, this is the now the logo that you'll see when we're celebrating or talking about the relationship between the tribe and the university. It's less about feathers, it's less about skin tone, uh, it's more modern, it's it's more of a graphic and it's less of a portrait of, a, of a, an, an imagined person. Um, and so more than the Indian head logo now, uh, you'll see this logo, which represents the connection between the Miami nation on the left with the black and the Miami University and the red on the right and the shared space that they uh, that they work in in the center.
there are now, again, this is something that Kara will talk about, and then I'll turn to questions. Uh, Miami students do remarkably well at Miami University now. Um, in the 90s, the graduation rate was in the 40s, 40%. Uh, now it's uh, up over 90%. There have been 100 graduates of the Miami Heritage Program. So 100 Miami tribal Oklahoma citizens have gone through uh, Miami University. Um, 100 total since 1991. There are now 38 total students. I think that number will rise again next year. And this is kind of the graph that uh, Kara Strauss, my colleague, has developed uh, to show that growth of Miami students over time. So this is a place that you see a lot of Miami people on campus nowadays. And that certainly wasn't the case in 1970, where there weren't any Miami people on campus. Um, so it's been a, it's been a real change like showing pictures of individuals because it helps put a face on the relationship. And so this is, uh, this is the logo. So uh, again, this is a photo of the question about what, what can we do to visit Miami, Oklahoma. This is a winter gathering called Moxing Game where you can see President Crawford on the right playing the game with uh, chief of the Miami Nation, chief of the Miami tribe, Doug Langford, who's in the blazer on the, on the left. Um, playing this game and smiling. So um, that's at a winter gathering where a lot of Miami pe University people attend those games and storytelling sessions. So now we've come back to the land acknowledgement. We've talked about the land, we've talked about the relationship. And the last part uh, I think is important and goes far beyond other land acknowledgements, which is Miami University and the Miami tribe are proud of this work. So you recognize that it used to be and maybe still is Miami land, Indian land, but what are you gonna do about it is the harder question. And Miami University is, is telling us through their land acknowledgement and the, the tribe as well is telling us, this is what we're doing about it. We're doing research, we're building Miami education in addition to Miami University education. Um, and both partners are proud of this work and of the more than 140 Miami students who have attended Miami since 1991. So that's a book in an hour, as short as I could go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So we, actually have, we have quite a few comments that have been in regards to thanking you for your presentation. And uh, there are some alums on, on here that were students in the 70s. And so hmm. definitely under what was happening at, at that point in time. Uh, one question that has come in um, is related to the name Red Hawks. Do you know if it was used prior to 96 at all? And now I'm getting a UPS delivery, so my dog is barking again. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. That was really loud at the beginning, too. I didn't. Uh... Not a problem. Okay. Was Red Hawks used before 1996? Yeah, here, buddy. No. That was a suggestion in, 19... in 1996. Uh, the, uh, there was a committee to choose a new name. Uh, they got uh, thousands of, uh, I think, close to a thousand uh, suggestions. Many of them were poking fun at Miami University, um, but they they decided uh, between some things like the Miami Arrows, the Miami Miamis, the Miami Red Hawks uh, had the best feedback based on outreach groups, alumni. Um, so the, the committee to suggest a new name suggested Red Hawks as the front runner um, based on their research and suggestions that came in from alumni primarily. Yep. And, I, and to go with that, does the red-tailed hawk have any sort of connection to this area, to to the Miami people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really, yeah, it's a great question. Um, some of the ideas and some of the changes that other universities have made, uh, so eagles are very uh, important to a lot of indigenous communities in the United States, eagles and eagle feathers. Uh, have have a pretty elevated place in these cultures. And so I think eagles was one of the ideas and the tribe and university wanted to stay away from something that was really culturally significant to the Miami tribe because it would not be appropriate, let's say for non-native people to wear eagle feathers, for example. So they chose red hawk because it's indigenous to the red-tailed hawk. Um, it's a play on 
red-tailed hawk. Red hawk is not is not an actual species, um, but it kind of allows you to keep the red uh, motif, the red uh, red and white. Obviously, um, it's similar in kind of sound and uh, syllables to the old nickname, uh, and it's a it's a bird that's both in Ohio and in Oklahoma. Um, it's a predator. Uh, these are kind of the things that they thought about. Yeah. Uh, so we'll finish with one last question. Thank you again, Cam, for all of your time today. Um, what is the best way that alumni can support this partnership? Yeah, good question. I hope that I hope you have some links or something. Yes, we can definitely share some links. Yeah. I would go to um, the Miami Center's webpage um, and read more about the tribe and the partnership. Uh, there are some great blogs that we work on, history and culture. Um, so it's not just history, it's really about community, uh, community blog. Um, there are funds that you could uh, contribute to if you want to uh, support Miami students who do really uh, amazing work. Um, so those are Miami tribe citizens who are students here at the university. Um, their special projects require some funding, some materials, let's say for a moxin making workshop or a ribbon work workshop or things like that. Um, so I don't have those links on hand, but maybe Ellie. Maybe yeah, you. we can make sure that they're in the follow up email as well as on the web page. Yeah, and there's a there's a newsletter also that the Miami Center sends out that might be of interest to some of those in the audience. It's just a monthly thing. Um, so I think that's another opportunity just to learn about what's going on. Great. Well, thank you so much, Cam, for joining us today. And thank you for everyone watching. Um, this webinar is a part of a six part series. Our next one will be on Wednesday, August 10th at noon Eastern time. For the session will be on the Miami student experience, as Cam talked about a little bit. Um, so thank you all for joining us and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.